Okay, I am so incredibly honored and privileged to be presenting here at PG&E. Uh, my husband, Osman Pukhlar, is in energy procurement, and he has been with PG&E for the past almost 30 years. He went away for four years in the middle, but PG&E has been a consistent source of blessings for my husband, for me, and for our three sons. And so when we were asked if we would be willing to come and share a little bit about our faith tradition, I jumped at the opportunity to be able to come and give back in any small way. But our willingness to come and teach would have been pointless if nobody had been willing to come and learn. So we're very, very grateful that you took time out of your lunch hour to join us today. <clears throat> So along with explaining what Islam is, which is what Dr. Elsa so efficiently took care of, we also feel that it's very critical to talk about what Islam is not. And since we're very limited on time today, I'm going to try and tackle two of the main myths that we get asked about in interfaith discussions around the Bay Area. And then I'm hopeful that during Q&A or during our private conversations afterwards, we can talk about some of the other misconceptions that people might be wondering about. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first myth, Sharia is coming to take over America. <laughs> I was presenting at a church in the East Bay and a little old lady stood up at the microphone and with a quavering voice she said, I'm so upset because I just found out that Sharia has come to our country and has taken over our courts, and judges are now deciding cases based, making their rulings based on the sacred law of other faith traditions, and I'm furious about it. And I want you to explain it to me. And I didn't even know where to start with her. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I, I was taken aback by that. But at the same time, her fear was very, very real, and it could not be denied and she needed to be appeased. And if there are you know, certain news, evening news programs, if we spend a lot of time with those uh, TV stations, it's very natural to start to believe that Muslims, who are today's boogeymen, after all, that Muslims are here to take over the land with their different ways of thinking and believing and living. But nothing could actually be further from the truth. So to begin with, what is Sharia? So should, the word sharia means the way or the path to God. It refers to the very idea of God communicating with human beings through revelation. And sharia is simply put, a moral code. Before it's a legal code, it's a moral code. So if we can have the next slide. It contains rules for behavior. Muslims, similar to how rabbinical or Talmudic law derives kosher dietary rules and restrictions. And it's not so much a codified rule book, nor is it merely a set of higher principles. Muslims see Sharia as the ongoing search for God's prescriptions for human action. And so Sharia should first be understood by its goals and its values before any of its specific so Sharia is more concerned with sin than it is with crime. So for example, if I were to gossip and backbite with one of my friends about another friend, there's no earthly law that's going to hold me accountable <clears throat> for that behavior. But I do know that I will be held accountable by God on the day of judgment if I don't repent and change my ways. But it's Sharia that tells me that I'm actually prohibited from slandering anyone. Now, as Dr. Asad explained, we worship God with our minds, our bodies, and our souls. Sharia is concerned with everything to do with our conduct. And it defines all the aspects of a Muslim's actions and behavior. It dictates everything from what we eat to what we don't eat, from how we dress to how we don't dress to our worship, uh, to the rules of our worship, the rules of marriage and divorce, rules of inheritance, and the rules of what's required of us and what's forbidden. The entire Sharia is designed to protect human welfare, which Muslims define through six 
universal core universal interests. The first one is the right to religion. So you can't force anybody to convert to any other faith tradition. The second is the right to life. You can't kill anyone unjustly. So every rule of Sharia that you're ever going to hear about, if you look at it, you will see that it will be protecting one of these six rights. The third is the right to family and lineage. Everybody has a right to know where they come from. So the fact that Muslims are taught that sex is confined to marriage isn't because of just some divine decree. It's also it's because of the desire to protect family bonds. The fourth is the right to honor and dignity. So we can't slander, we can't lie, we can't backbite about people. So tabloid journalism would be completely out for someone who's following Sharia. The fifth is the right to intellect and reason. So Muslims know that intoxicants are prohibited for them, so we don't drink alcohol or take recreational drugs. But Sharia is very nuanced. It's black and white. Uh, it's, sorry, it's got gray areas. It's not just black and white. So for example, anesthesia in times of surgery, it affects our ability to reason and to make moral decisions, but it has its own rules and its own exceptions. And then the sixth is the right to property and wealth. So we can't steal or usurp wealth or cheat anyone out of what's theirs. Now Muslim jurists discovered these Sharia rules through four primary sources. The first is the Holy Quran, book, the second of the words and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the third is universal agreement amongst Muslim scholars or the Muslim community on any given issue, and then the fourth is careful use of analogy. One thing people may not realize is that Islam does not allow for anarchy or chaos. We have to have some system of government in place, even if it's not a Muslim one and we're required to respect and obey the laws of the land. In fact, I once learned from a Muslim scholar that if we ever deliberately run through a red light, then we actually have to ask God for forgiveness because, and we have to um, decide that we're never going to make that mistake again because we agreed to follow certain laws when we got our driver's test, so we're not allowed to break them on purpose. So that's just an example of how religion informs our actions. Now, Sharia tells us that if we can't practice our religion in peace and harmony and safety, and if we aren't happy with the laws of the land, then we actually need to migrate from that land to a place where we are safe. And the highest law of the land in the United States of America right now is the Constitution. So according to the Muslims' own Sharia, we're required to respect the Constitution. If we don't, we're supposed to leave. And believe you me, with everything that's going on in the political landscape right now, there's no one more concerned about protecting the Constitution right now than your fellow Muslim Americans. So, what about penal code punishments? That's the elephant in the room. That's what everybody thinks about when they hear the words Sharia law. Beheadings, cutting off of hands, whippings, stonings, etc. Yes, there is a penal code within the Sharia. Just like United States law has capital punishment for certain offenses, Sharia law also has a form of capital punishment. But the important differences between capital punishment in American law and capital punishment in Sharia law are two. The first is that the penal code is first and foremost meant as a deterrent. It's not actually meant to be implemented. And the second is that the evidence required to establish proof of a punishable crime makes the punishment almost impossible to implement. So for example, the penal code for adultery is death. However, the evidence we require to prove adultery is four witnesses who've actually witnessed the act. So as you can see, the punishment is there, but it's first and foremost meant as a deterrent. It's meant to illustrate to human beings 
the enormity of the sin in God's eyes. And it's meant to ensure that these types of crimes or sins that affect society at large are not being done out in the open and are not becoming the norm. So if we want to look at how Sharia is implemented, we can look at the Ottoman Empire, which was the last legitimate Muslim government that ruled a large portion of the world for almost 700 years. The punishment for adultery during that time, all 700 years, was implemented only once. And even after that one time, the scholars protested it, so it never ended up being repeated again. The other very important fact for people to understand is that according to Sharia itself, the laws of Sharia can only be applied and upheld where there's a legitimate Muslim government in power. <coughs> A majority of Muslim scholars today are in agreement that no such government currently exists in the world, and therefore there's no official body which has the authority to implement the penal code punishments, which, by the way, only make up 0.1% of the body of Sharia law. Unfortunately, when one hears the word Sharia law, they just only imagine grisly capital punishments. And when you see those horrific images on the internet or hear those stories of those types of punishments, you should know that Muslims actually consider that to be vigilantism. It's in no way sanctioned in Islam, and it's actually forbidden by our scholars and our jurists. And when you see isolated rulings being implemented by certain governments around the world, you should know that they don't represent the meaning and spirit of Sharia itself. And just like any other community, you're going to find the whole spectrum of practice and adherence to the rules of the faith, even amongst Muslims. And so you'll find people who, out of personal conviction here in the United States of America, will, strict, will stick with the rules of Sharia in their lives. Um, and then you'll find people who don't even know much about what the basic rulings are. But they still consider themselves to be Muslims, and they are, as long as they believe in the testimony of faith that Dr. Asif had explained. Okay, so the second myth, oppressed in Islam. This is probably the most common question I get asked about, along with, with the question about Sharia. So yes, just like anywhere else in the world, there are some Muslim women who are oppressed, and in some Muslim-majority countries, there is a culture that is favorable to men, and there are stories of domestic abuse in some Muslim households. But the real question is, does Islam teach, condone, or in any way support the oppression of women? And the answer is absolutely not. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the best of you are the ones who are the best to their women. The majority of the focus of his last sermon was on the rights of women. And Muslims believe in the story of Adam and Eve, but in Islam, Eve is not held accountable for Adam's mistakes. They're both held equally responsible. She's not the one to blame. She's not considered to be a temptress, nor is she seen as the reason that mankind lost paradise. Now, there seem, seem to be a few reasons why Islam gets this bad rap. Next slide, please. So the first is the hijab, which people use as a shorthand for the headscarf. It doesn't actually mean headscarf, but it's fine that people use the word hijab for that now. But hijab actually means barrier, and it sets up boundaries for interaction between men and women. It's the first thing that people see, and they usually don't understand it. They don't necessarily think of the Virgin Mary when they see the headscarf. They usually wonder, why women have to wear it, and men don't. But the truth is actually men also, Muslim men have parts of their bodies that they're required to cover, according to Sharia. They have to cover from their navels to their knees. So they can't expose their belly buttons, they can't expose their kneecaps, no speedos. Um, so why the different rules? So we have different rules here in America as well. If a man and a woman were jogging in the park and it was a hot day and they were sweaty and uncomfortable, the man could pull off his shirt and run, continue running bare-chested. The woman, if she did the same thing, she'd be arrested for public indecency. Why? Why the difference? 
So we believe that our rules for how we dress are divinely inspired and that God understands what's best for us since he is our creator after all. And the second is that women pray behind men. If you were to come to a mosque and you were to observe the congregational prayer, you would see the men um, lined up in rows and then you would see the women lined up in rows behind them. And some people bring to that the framework of Rosa Parks. They'll think that you know the way Rosa Parks was forced to the back of the bus, that's what's going on with the women as well. But that's actually not the case. Where you stand in the prayer actually has nothing to do with your standing with God or your position with God. If you observe the Muslim prayer, it's very, very intimate. We stand close together, or shoulder to shoulder. We stand, we bow, and we prostrate on the ground with our bottoms up in the air. And many women would not be comfortable with having men behind them when they're in that vulnerable position. And so it's really about privacy, and it's about modesty, and it's about being able to focus on your relationship with God and not worrying about who you're standing next to or standing in front of or standing behind. Islam gives both men and women equal access to getting to God, to getting to paradise, and to getting to his divine pleasure. And then the third is that people often confuse Saudi Arabia with Islam. They see how women are treated in countries like Saudi Arabia, and they think that that's how Islam treats women. The two holiest cities in Islam, Mecca and Medina, happen to be in the land that is currently called Saudi Arabia. However, Saudi Arabia does not hold religious authority over the world's population of Muslims. Saudi Arabia is not for Muslims, what the Vatican is for Catholics. Their government can make whatever laws they want to, but that doesn't give them legitimacy over the world's population of Muslims. The fact that women in Saudi Arabia only just started driving in 2018 is due to a Saudi law. I've had people say to me, how can you be part of a religion that doesn't allow you to drive? I'm not part of a religion that doesn't allow them to drive. <laughs> so, Muslim women have been heads of state in Muslim-majority countries. One of the current vice presidents of Iran is a woman. Even women in the United States haven't managed to shatter that glass ceiling quite yet, but who knows, things might be changing soon. So that is just two of the common myths and uh, misconceptions I wanted to share with you today, and hopefully we'll be able to talk to some more during Q&A. Thank you very much.